Okay, welcome to uh, the first class of networking and communication, which is ETEC 3201. And today, as a quick overview of what we're going to do, uh, we're going to go over the syllabus, uh, talk about my teaching philosophy and some course goals. In other words, what you're going to get out of this class and what you're not going to get out of this class. And then we're going to start into a little bit of material today uh, with a quick intro uh, to networking and communication. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the first thing is the course expectations. Uh, and to look at that, let's start off with looking at the syllabus. So give me just a second here uh, to switch over so we can see the syllabus. All right, so here's the course syllabus. So starting off, uh, this is section one uh, of ETEC 3201. Uh, the time and place, Monday and Wednesday, 2.30 to 4.45. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, because this class is, you know, it's a place that says online and in 104 Advanced Technology Center. This is going to be a hybrid class, meaning that you're going to have some uh, experiences as online lectures. You're going to have some potentially experiences uh, either taking exams and or doing some of the labs uh, that are in person in 104 ATC. And the 104 is the tiered lecture hall directly behind the planetarium. Or if you're looking at the entrance to the planetarium, you look to the left, this little hallway that goes around to a lecture hall back there. All right, and structure information. My name is Paul Yost. Uh, if you refer to me, you can certainly refer to me as Paul. Um, uh, we don't need to keep things super formal. Uh, office is 307 ATC building, uh, third floor. Uh, if you take the elevator next to the planetarium entrance all the way up to the third floor, uh, make a left, make another left, walk all the way back, turn right, my office is right there on the left. So um, one thing about office hours though, I have times listed there, 1.30 to 2.30 and 4.45 to 5 on Monday and Wednesday, and then Tuesday and Thursday from 4.15 to 5, and I'll be available for office hours, uh, but I won't necessarily be in my office. So if you need help, uh, then I want you to either call me, uh, we'll set up a Zoom conference, send me a text message, we'll set up a Zoom, Zoom conference if necessary, um, or just email me and I'll and arrange some sort of Zoom appointment with me. Or if you just uh, email me, I'll respond to those emails uh, in a timely fashion as much as I can. Um, but if you need face-to-face -face help, I'm certainly happy to, uh, to come in and um, sit down with you face-to-face uh, we'll talk about that more in just a second. Now, that phone number that's listed there, uh, that phone number is my cell phone. So feel free to send me text messages on that or give a call. But if you give a call and I don't answer, leave a voicemail because otherwise I'll assume you're somebody trying to sell me an extended car warranty and I won't answer. All right. My email, the one I preferred you use is the Shawnee one, uh, pos at shawnee.edu. But if you have something that's an absolute emergency, feel free to send an email to both the Shawnee address and my Gmail address that's listed there. Now, a little note about the office hours. Let me scroll up here a little bit so you can see that. Uh, due to the pandemic, uh, I'll be conducting office hours mostly remotely. I will come in if, uh, if necessary, but that means I'll be fully available by email, text message, uh, phone, if you call me, uh, Facebook Messenger, Discord, however you want to get a hold of me, feel free to get a hold of me. Uh, but also, if you need a face-to-face -face meeting and feel like that would help, or if we have start a conversation, I say, you know what, let's just meet. Uh, I'd be happy to come down and meet with you. And that includes evenings and weekends as necessary. So if you have any kind of issue, uh, feel free to get a hold of me. And I can, as long as I'm not doing something else or out of the area, I can come down. I'm only a few blocks from the university uh, here in my building. So... I can come down and meet with you. One thing though is make sure to set up an appointment for that and make sure to wear a mask uh, if we're gonna visit face to face. I might also have you, when you set up that appointment, meet in a classroom where there's more space. All right, textbooks, there's no textbook for the class. Um, all of the information will be posted on the course uh, site, uh, including most of the lectures. And so it's gonna be your responsibility to get that information. I may post other supplemental material on that site like uh, uh, programming guides or programming example code or something like that. Um, but if I post that, it's gonna be up to you uh, to make sure you're up to date on that and check in with the course site and get that stuff. 
I may also send out some uh, letters or messages periodically via email, but mostly everything, even if I send an email, it'll be posted to the uh, Blackboard course site. Okay, materials. Uh, there are going to be some materials that you're going to need for this class, uh, and those materials are easily purchased through online retailers like Amazon, uh, and you can get them a couple days later. Um, if uh, you're uh, interested in those materials, what you're going to need right now, there will be, I will talk about that more later on, uh, not today, but next class, but you're going to need two Arduino Uno single board computer kits. Uh, you're going to need two NRF24L01 wireless modules uh, and some DuPont style wires to, to connect them together. Uh, and we're going to use those uh, single board computers for the first roughly half of the class. Um, and then we're going to switch into using uh, doing internet programming, which you just need a laptop. So you'll also need access to a laptop. You don't need two laptops. You'll need one laptop, maybe. It doesn't even have to be a laptop. You could do all this stuff on a desktop machine as well. Uh, and the total cost of those materials you need with the two Arduinos and the wireless modules is going to be, uh, I don't know, maybe $25. So it's not a huge expense, well below the cost of any textbook you would have for any class that you're, uh, you'd ever take. So, um, I'll give you more details on those uh, going forward, uh, really probably next class, so you can get those things ordered and have them available for the class. All right, course description. Uh, the course description, uh, let's look at the catalog description and then we'll talk about my description. So the catalog description says interfacing to a computer system or interfacing a computer system to external devices which support asynchronous and synchronous communications. Uh, flow control paths, data transfer packets, and physical interfaces, a study of the ISO uh, model protocols, logical connections and services, streams and datagrams, LANs, internet networking, routers, and servers. Now, that's a very concise description that is in the catalog. My description is, to be useful, a computer system must communicate in some form or another. In other words, uh, it, for a computer that doesn't communicate isn't really that useful. It doesn't... Uh, um, serve a function if it can't get information out of the system or into the system or from one system to another one. So the next sentence there, communication is the exchange or conveyance of information from one entity to another. In computer systems, that communication may between, be between two computer systems, among many computer systems, or within a computer system itself. In this class, we will focus on the concepts of information transfer at both a conceptual level and a practical level. Lab activities will be focused on writing software that facilitates the understanding of both theoretical and practical aspects of communication. Topics covered may include, and then I have a whole list of topics there. Uh, notice toward the end of that, there's something in my description that isn't in the um, materials, or in the uh, uh, course description up, up above, the catalog one, and that is... Um, real-time game server uh, concepts. And even if you're a CET major, uh, that's going to be useful for you to have exposure to because a real-time server doesn't necessarily just have to be for a game. It could be for anything. It could be for a, a streaming video service. It could be for uh, an industrial control system that needs to stream out uh, um, sensor data. Uh, so that is going to be there. And you're not going to have to like know graphics or anything like that. So don't be too worried about that. Lab assignments will generally include both hardware and software activities. So, attendance. Uh, since most, most of the uh, lectures will be given online, uh, the attendance isn't really mandatory. I'm not going to take attendance, but you're responsible for all uh, the lecture uh, material, making sure that you get that, making sure you watch those. And I'm going to... Uh, suggest some things here in just a little bit rel related to that. Grading system, it says tentative, but this is the grading system we're going to use. 40% uh, homework programs, projects, quizzes, 25% midterm, 35% final exam, and the final exam is, just by the nature of the class, going to be comprehensive. Uh, additionally, the final exam, hat, and this is a rule that a lot of people uh, have heartburn over, but it's an important one for my classes, the final exam has to be passed in order to receive a passing grade for the class. In other words, if you completely bomb the final exam and get like, I don't know, like a 30% on the final exam, you're not going to pass the class. The final exam is 
my chance to say how to measure did you learn the stuff that you were supposed to learn in this class to an extent that I would feel comfortable saying this person is now ready to move on from this. And if you don't pass that, then you're not ready to move on. Uh, I've taught this class and other classes for a lot of years, and so I know how difficult to make the final. Um, and if if and I know how to make an exam that will illustrate whether or not you learned the material. And if you didn't learn the material, you don't deserve to move on, uh, and it's a disservice to you to let you move on. All right, the grading scale is listed there. Uh, so notice zero to fifty nine is an F. Anything sixty and above is a D. And again, final exam has to be passed in order to pass the class. Important rules, don't cheat. Uh, I really don't like uh, intellectual dishonesty, people who cheat to get ahead. Um, I think that uh, integrity and honesty are important virtues, important things to uh, that illustrate a lot about somebody's character. And people who uh, lie or cheat or manipulate in an attempt to uh, get ahead in life. Uh, I'm not going to uh, take kindly to people who are trying to lie to me or cheat me. And so I, I offer you respect and I expect to be treated similarly and that means don't cheat, don't lie to me, uh, don't try to pull a fast one and get one over on me uh, to help your grade. And really this class is an opportunity for you to learn and not a requirement to get through. So think about it as a way to improve yourself. We'll talk more about that here in a second as well. So any type of academic misconduct will be dealt with uh, severely. Uh, the other important rule is no disruption. Uh, and that includes whether we're in class or on a Zoom meeting or something like that or in the exam. And so just be respectful. Other people paying to be in the class, paying to learn stuff. They want to learn the stuff. They want to be better people. So don't abuse the uh, the your freedom and your position in that class and uh, interfere with others. In other words, I give uh, quite a bit of freedom to uh, students. Don't abuse it. All right, programming assignments. You are going to have programming assignments in here. They'll all be uh, submitted via uh, the course site on Blackboard. If you have a problem with submitting something on Blackboard, send me an email to let me know that and we'll figure it out. Uh, but if you just send a random email with an assignment to my Gmail address, I'm not going to accept it. You need to submit it the proper way because I grade everything on there. I submit it. Now, if you have some problem with uh, uh, the course site and you can't get in and you say, oh, this thing was due and I'm sorry, here, here it is and uh, can I send you it to you via email, I'll probably say yes and then help you figure out the, uh, the problems that you're having. But just make sure to contact me, send me a text message. Uh, or send me an email to let me know you're having issues and then we'll figure it out and I'll offer a way for you to submit stuff if we absolutely can't figure it out. All right. Exams and quizzes, uh, they'll be announced at least uh, one week before they're given. So there won't be any makeup tests uh, unless you make prior arrangements with me. So in other words, uh, if you just blow off the midterm and don't take it, and then you come to me two weeks later and say, oh, I missed the midterm, can I take it now? I'm probably going to say no, unless you have uh, some sort of uh, uh, excused absence that's documented uh, or you've made an uh, attempt to uh, make some arrangements prior to missing that exam. But if you're like on a sports team or you have something or uh, you're in the hospital or you have uh, some other... Uh, health issue, make sure to communicate that with me uh, so that I can work with you to so that you can still take the exam. Now, uh, quizzes will be given throughout the semester. Those aren't necessarily announced, although in a lot of the lectures I will hint at them. So I'll generally post those to Blackboard. Um, and so there won't be any makeup for that. So if you just decide not to look at the course site for three days and then you look at it and like, oh, I missed an exam or I missed a quiz then too bad. It's your responsibility to check in. Just like if you have a job, it's your responsibility to go to work uh, with this class. It's your responsibility to go on those uh, two days a week, check the course site, 
look at the material, take the quizzes when they're there, uh, take the, uh, or complete the assignments when they're posted by the deadlines and so forth. Okay, now ADA statement, uh, if you have some sort of uh, accommodation uh, that need that's based on some documented disability, you need to first work with the coordinator and the Office of Account or Accessibility Services, and the phone number is listed there. Uh, and if, again, if you feel like you have some uh, disability that needs an accommodation, then communicate with me. Also, you need to communicate. You need to do it. I'm not going to do it for you with the Office of Accessibility Services. And throughout the semester, even if you have communicated with them, uh, it's important that you still communicate with me. In other words, uh, I'll get an accommodation letter, but before the exam, some people that have accommodation letters uh, feel in certain classes that they're okay without uh, um, arrangements being made. Some people feel like they need arrangements to be made, but I need you to communicate with me. For example, before the exam, uh, you need to communicate with me. So for example, if you uh, are visually impaired and you can't read the stuff on the exam uh, and you need uh, a PDF copy that uh, has the, I don't know, maybe there's some images on there and they need to be explained and the, the format that I put it in uh, is not appropriate, you need to work with me on that and communicate with me. If you need extra time or need to take the test in a quiet place like the Student Success Center, let me know that before the exam or uh, at the time I post the quiz or whatever it is and I'll make a reasonable accommodation for that. Uh, also there's a Title IX statement on there that you should read through and that that basically states the university is committed to maintaining an environment that's free from any kind of retaliation, harassment, discrimination uh, on the basis of race, color, uh, genetic information, religion, age, disability, national origin, ancestry, sex, status as a parent uh, during pregnancy uh, or uh, immediately following childbirth, status as a parent of a young child, status as a foster parent, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity or gender expression, uh, veteran status or military status. So all of those things there, um, you are uh, entitled to be free from any kind of discrimination, retaliation, or harassment for those things. And so if you feel like um, there's some sort of discrimination or harassment going on, then there are a couple of ways you can deal with that. And if you look on that uh, statement there, on the syllabus here I've provided um, the information for the Title IX coordinator for the university. The phone number is there and her name is Monique Harmon and there's also a place to report concerns uh, on that incident report uh, URL that's there. So if you feel like something throughout the semester has happened that needs to be reported, then go to that uh, URL that I go or open my syllabus, go to that URL or call uh, Monique at that number that's listed there. Now reporting something doesn't automatically trigger a formal action. But uh, you or the people involved in that incident uh, may be entitled to some sort of uh, resource or accommodation or help. Uh, so if you see something or if you've been yourself a victim of something, reach out and get help with that. And you can even talk to me about that later if you want to. But note that if you talk to me, um, it's going to be important for me than to not keep something quiet. I, I'll need, I'm required to report those things to Monique and talk with her. She's not necessarily, that doesn't make it a formal action. That just means that uh, it, it's important for me to have a safe environment for everybody that's free from those things. So if I see something or hear something, I'll have to pass that on as well, just like you should uh, do that. Okay, let's get into some actual course material. So that's the, the syllabus. And I want to go back to the, uh, the presentation here. So give me one second to switch my window. Okay, so we looked at the syllabus. Now, let's talk just briefly about my teaching philosophy. My teaching philosophy is that verb phrase, to teach, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And that se might seem surprising for uh, somebody whose profession, at least partial profession, is to be a college professor and teach people things. 
But the problem with to teach is that it's uh, putting the emphasis on the wrong side. That I, you can't teach somebody if they're unable to learn. So for example, uh, other verb phrases make sense, like to drop. As soon as I drop that pen, it has no choice. It's going to fall. Or maybe to tap. It doesn't have a choice in it. But to teach, I can't just teach somebody something without them taking an active role and learning. So the reason I say that to teach doesn't make a lot of sense is that uh, my job isn't to force something onto you and force you to do something because I really can't. My job is to be more like your guide or uh, your kind of Sherpa or uh, wizard friendly wizard professor that is, makes it as easy as possible for you to learn. So the, let, so what you need to think about is reversing that, that think about it as I have a chance in this class to learn things and uh, Paul is going to make it as easy as possible for me to do that and help me. But that also putting the emphasis on you means that if you feel like you're not learning this stuff or you need help, you need to say, hey, Sherpa, I'm having trouble climbing up this mountain. Will you help me? And I will always be there to help you. I always say yes. But you need to ask for that help and you need to take that active role in your learning. You're not a passive entity uh, like a, uh, a potted plant that I'm watering and uh, putting plant food in and putting in the sun. You are an active entity. Uh, take responsibility for that and give yourself respect uh, and adopt that position of you want to learn this because it's good stuff to learn. Now, course goals. Uh, this class is going to have a mix of some theoretical stuff and some hands-on practice and some specific technologies. And the idea here is we're going to prepare students to be good developers and engineers. Uh, and I also want, the reason that's important is because networking and communication is important. For example, as you're watching this video right now on YouTube, that's networking and communication in, in action. YouTube is streaming data to your screen so you can watch it. It's streaming data that makes the video. It's streaming data that makes the audio. Uh, and your cell phone or laptop, the processor is communicating with memory. The processor is communicating with the network card. The processor is communicating with the mouse and the touch screen. Uh, if you have one or the touchpad, if you're on something like a laptop, all of that stuff is all communication. Even as I'm recording this, uh, the microphone that I'm wearing is uh, recording data that's communicating that data to the processor that's then going across the network to YouTube. So it's important. It's in every computer system that you use has communication going on in it. Any uh, online game you play or even offline game you play, there's communication. There's the processor communicating with the video card, communicating with the screen. It's everywhere. And like I said earlier, computer systems are useless without the ability to communicate. So another thing, though, is if you're an unskilled or ignorant practitioner of uh, this, in other words, you're a, an engineer but a bad one that doesn't know things like you should, it can be dangerous. And the other side of that coin is if you're skilled and you know things, you're knowledgeable, that can be valuable. Uh, you'll get a better job. You'll be able to write code that you otherwise wouldn't uh, be able to write. You'll be able to do things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And I've said this before in other classes, and I, this is something I truly believe, that engineering and computer programming, computer engineering, is the closest thing you we have to being able to do real magic. That you can dream something up, you can take those ideas out of your head, you can put them into a piece of hardware or into a piece of software, and now those ideas are doing something in that. That's absolutely magical to me. And so think of yourself as a, uh, like, uh, one of Harry Potter's classmates, you're going to a school where you can learn to do wizardly amazing things. And uh, my job is to teach you how to do those things uh, and be a better wizard and do th magical things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do if you didn't know this stuff. All right, now, uh, another goal of this course is to improve your skills. In other words, analysis of problems, uh, exposure to and understanding of various technologies. Uh, gain knowledge and understanding, and develop stronger programming skills. In other words, I'm tr the goal of this class is to make you a better wizard. All right, now, good students, uh, 
at least successful students in this class tend to be interested and self-motivated, uh, focus on learning opportunities and not just getting through the class or it's a requirement, so I gotta do this. Paul's mean, he's making me take a test. Don't think of it that way. Think about everything as an opportunity to improve yourself and learn stuff that's going to make you more powerful and more employable uh, at a higher level. You also need to be uh, willing to do the work and you need to be a little bit tenacious. Sometimes things might not work or the code you write is maybe going to uh, not work the first time you write it. Maybe the system you wire up is not going to communicate the first time you try it, but you need to be tenacious uh, and say, okay, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm committed to figuring this out. And that's true for a lot of things in life. For example, uh, Imagine if you were a baby and you tried to walk and you fell over and you're like, well, I guess I'll just crawl for the rest of my life and not try again. Uh, and uh, humans uh, tend to be tenacious if they're interested. And that leads back to this interested and self-motivated one that's at the top. So again, my job is to be your guide, uh, your Sherpa, your shaman, whatever you want to think of it as, uh, your wizard professor. And... My job is to make it as easy as I can for you to learn the material. Uh, and my job is to help you also learn how to learn on your own. So in other words, I might not give you the answer the first time directly. I might not, uh, if you give me some code that's broken, I might not just fix it for you and give it back to you. And that's not because I'm lazy or mean. It's because you need to learn how to learn and you need to figure out how to figure things out. That's part of what learning is about. So if you send me code, I might respond in an email and say, my code's broke, uh, I need help fixing it. Then I might respond back, well, what are you doing on line 15? That looks a little bit weird to me. That might be my response to you. Or what is your algorithm here? What are you trying to do? Uh, and why do you think the way you're doing it should work? Explain to me what you're trying to do. So I might respond to your question with other questions. And again, that's because my job is to be your guide and help you learn the material, but also learn to learn. It doesn't do you any good. Uh, again, think of it like me being your guide to a mount, mountain expedition um, to the top of a mountain. If you said, wow, it's this route is really difficult for me, uh, I'm having uh, trouble, it wouldn't do you any good for me to just like put a rope around uh, your leg and then drag you up the mountain uh, on your back. You wouldn't learn anything. You wouldn't exercise your muscles. You wouldn't get any better at mountaineering, but I might, it would help you maybe to say, well, let's stop and rest for a little bit and let's try a different route. Let's, instead of climbing straight up the mountain, let's go back on this other trail and try that way. Maybe that will help. Or maybe let's uh, rest for a little bit and just uh, look at the next, uh, rock up there. Let's just get to that and then we'll take another rest. So my job is to help you get to that mount, top of that mountain yourself, not to drag you up there. And honestly, uh, I don't really like the idea of dragging people where they don't want to go. So again, you need to be self-motivated uh, and ask when you need help. Okay, a couple other things before we dig into some material here. Let's talk about what this course isn't and is. This course is not designed to only present theoretical abstract material. In other words, this is not an abstract uh, information theory uh, version of a communications class. Conversely, it's also not designed to train you to be a network administrator, train you to install cables and routers, uh, provide you with some sort of certifications like uh, that should say MCSE or Microsoft, Cisco, or whatever. Uh, so this is not designed to provide you with those. It's also uh, not designed to teach you about a particular vendor's specific technology. In other words, this class, we're going to use some specific technologies, but the goal of this class isn't how to configure a Cisco router. If you want to know how to do that, Google it. But it is designed to teach you some underlying things. Let's look, actually, let's look at what it's designed to do. What is the course designed to do? It's designed to teach you about general communication concepts, teach you about specific communication technologies, um, not a certain vendor's technologies, but certain types of technology, uh, improve and enlarge your programming and engineering skill set, teach you how to, uh, or how a variety of systems communicate. There's a typo there. I'll fix that before I post the slides. 
Uh, and it's also designed to give you some practical hands-on experiences related to the material we're covering here. Rather than just being, I'm going to lecture, you're going to take a test or a quiz, you're going to do some stuff. We're going to wire up some systems, uh, some little computer systems. We're going to connect wires between them. We're going to get this to transfer emission over to there. Later on in the class, we're going to take your computer, have it communicate over the network uh, with another system, exchange data uh, between those systems using uh, the internet. Now, this class is going to be a balanced approach to both theoretical and practical, and we're also going to uh, talk about some broad concepts as well as specific experiences in here. All right, so let's get the uh, party started, right? That's, that's awful. Um, but to get started in this, let's start with telecommunication. Telecommunication is kind of the remote exchange of information. In other words, tele means to or at a distance, uh, like telekinesis or telephone. Uh, communication means the imparting or exchanging of information. So let's look at the dictionary definition of that word. So the dictionary definition for telecommunication, uh, I copied and pasted there, and here's the uh, pronunciation of it. Telecommunication. Telecommunication. And that says communication over a distance by cable, telegraph, telephone, or broadcasting. And it also is kind of the branch of technology concerned with telecommunication, the field of telecommunications. So before we get too much farther than that, I want to do a little uh, brief history of this. And then we'll circle back to some general overarching concepts. When is the beginning? When was the first system uh, created that performed telecommunication? And this might be uh, surprising to some people that telecommunication has been around for actually quite a while. So how long has it been around? If you want, you can pause this and kind of think about that. Think about how long, uh, get an, an, a date in your mind for when you think that would be and then here in a couple minutes, we're going to move on to the next slide, and I'm going to, uh, we're going to answer that question. Okay, so hopefully you thought of that. Uh, so when did you think telecommunication started? And actually, a lot of people uh, that I've asked this question in the class and classrooms are like, uh, I don't know, around the time of the telephone or maybe uh, the, the telegraph. Well, let's, so maybe like 1850 or something like that. Well, let's actually take a look at it. The first telecommunication system was all the way back before the U.S. was a country. So 1774 is the first known one anyway. And that's a guy named uh, George Louis Lesage. And the, the Lesage, he created a thing called the Lesage Electrostatic Telegraph. And essentially it worked like this. It had this spinning wheel, which was actually a spinning wheel to turn wool into thread, the exact same uh, contraption. And he used that to generate static electricity. In other words, just like when you rub your feet on the carpet and it builds up a charge, or you rub a balloon on your head, although I guess I can't do that anymore. Um, you run a balloon on your, rub a balloon on your hair and then it sticks to uh, the ceiling. Same kind of concept, but he used a spinning wheel that spins to generate static electricity. Now, what he did is he took that static electricity and connected a wire to the thing that was get, gathering the static charge, and then he made a nail board. In other words, you have a bunch of nails sticking up that then each had a wire connected to that went to uh, that connecting wire, went to a little cup that was on the other end, and on the cup, uh, top of the cup, he placed a little, what they call a pith ball. And what a pith ball is, it's really just like a ball of lint or fuzz. Um, take a little wool ball, set it on top of there. Now, if you've ever uh, played around with static electricity, you'll know that some really lightweight thing like that will stick, will cling, uh, or jump around when you get static electricity near it. So the idea was he would take that, uh, that probe that had static flowing from the spinning wheel, he'd touch it to the one of the nails, and that would then send electrons flying down to the end of the cup, and the little pith ball would jump. Boop. Um, and if you've ever uh, opened a, uh, I don't know, uh, even a box that has a bunch of those stupid foam packing peanuts, and they have static charge, they like stick to stuff, and you move your hand near them, and they move around. That's kind of what we're talking about. In other words, when you touch that, he would touch the wire on one end, 
the little ball would jump on the other end. And since there were multiple wires with multiple cups with multiple balls, whichever one jumped, that was the, uh, the letter that was being sent. So here are some pictures of that. These are uh, actually some drawings from the era. And what you'll notice in each of these is here, I, I picked these two drawings because they show two different aspects of this invention. Uh, over here, you'll see all of the wires going across to this guy in the other room. And here's him over here to the side. You can see the spinning wheel right there generating the electricity. And then here, he's got the little probe in his hand or the stylus, and he would touch that to the letter he wanted to want to send. The charge would flow through the bundle of wires to the other end. And on the other end, you would see the little uh, pith ball jump. And now, to give a little bit more uh, of a view of that over here, here you can see the spinning wheel with some uh, somebody spinning it. This wheel is spinning, turning this little pulley thing, generating the static charge, and here he is sending it across the wire to the other room. And this guy is watching that and then writing down the results of the which one jumped at which time. All right, now a couple things about this. Uh, this did work. But, and it was simple, simple in concept, uh, but it had some problems. One is there are a lot of wires involved there. You need, if you have 26 letters of the alphabet, you need 26 wires. Uh, long distance was were awful, uh, or also difficult because you need, I don't know if you had, want it to travel a mile, you need 26 miles of wire uh, in order to make the thing jump. And also the longer the wire, the more charge you need because all those electrons have to go to the other end, there's line capacitance involved, and it's less likely that thing will jump on the other end. So the, his electrostatic telegraph inventions uh, were interesting, but they were largely impractical. So it was an interesting but largely impractical invention. But it did lead to this concept of you could use electricity to communicate information from one place to another place. And actually to show how impractical it was, you can kind of see here, it's just, I'm going to communicate a message from this room to this other room. Uh, and maybe they could close the doors and run the wire underneath the door, but it's really not something that you'd want to go from, I don't know, Paris to London easily. It's not going to work. Or maybe even just a mile away or a couple hundred feet away, it's going to be a difficult system to, to use. The other th problem that I met, that we maybe I forgot to mention is you have to watch all 26 things at once. This, in other words, oops, this guy here has to sit there and watch, and as soon as something jumps, he has to know which one jumped. And how, how would he know? He is like, oh, something on the right jump, but I don't know which one it was. And so maybe he would have to tap like, I don't know, like the, the let's say you're sending a message, hi, H, 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 and make the thing jump up and down and say, okay, that was an H, and then go on to the next letter. Okay, so moving ahead in history a little bit, that this did lead to other inventions. The next invention is uh, a guy named Samuel Thomas von Sommery. Uh, he was German. And in 1810, he invented this thing called elect the electrochemical telegraph. And it was similar to Lesage's telegraph, ex meaning that it had 26 wires. Uh, but a couple differences, the voltage rather than coming from this giant cumbersome spinning wheel that required somebody to sit there and spin it the whole time. It came from a, a voltaic pile, which is essentially like a modern battery. So the voltage came from a different source. And the, rather than the nail board connecting to cups with lint balls in it and having those things jumping up and down, it went to essentially what amounted to a fish tank, uh, which is it's pretty awesome. Uh, so you have this uh, glass tank with water in it that has uh, uh, maybe some salty water in it. And the idea is when a voltage is connected to one of those uh, wires, imagine a little wire in the bottom of the fish tank sticking up, and when you put a uh, voltage on that and another electrode in the water, what you're going to get is bubbles that come off of this as electrolysis happens. And electrolysis is essentially the water splitting into hydrogen and oxygen uh, due to an electrochemical reaction. And so you're going to get bubbles that come up to the surface of the tank. So what he did is that at the top of the tank, he had the letters. So if you looked at the tank, any circle that had bubbles coming up through it, that meant that that one was connected. And that's a little bit better than the jumping uh, lint ball idea, because you could, as long as you hold that stylus on there, you're going to keep getting bubbles. So rather than having to hit it over and over again, you could say H. And the H ring would have bubbles in it for a while. H which gives somebody more time to look at it. 
So each electrode was labeled with a letter. And notice it's also more compact than the Lesage system, or Lesage system, meaning that uh, you, all you need is this little glass tank, you need a pin board, you don't need the big spinning wheel, it can all be self-contained with a battery in it, uh, so it has some advantages. Let's look at a couple pictures of that. All right, so here are some pictures of that. Again, here's the bundle of 26 wires. This thing is the battery, or the uh, voltaic pile, and you basically would take this stylus and move it to whichever letter you want. And over here, you can clearly see a thing that looks like a fish tank. And when that uh, gets the voltage, bubbles come up under the letter that the wire is, or electrode is underneath. And over here, you can see uh, another representation from that. This is actually from one of the patent filings. Same kind of system over here. Bundle of wires going all the way to the other end. And here's the fish tank. Uh, and here's a close-up of that where you can see the letters uh, over here. Now, this one actually had something a little more interesting in that it actually had, uh, in this invention, you'll notice this bar up here that's connected to this lever and this little ball. Oop, let's go back. What, and then that ball would fall down into this funnel and it would hit that, which would make this bell go ding. So the idea here is bubbles, when they would come up, would hit this little cup and fill up with, uh, it would fill up with hydrogen and oxygen, which would give it enough buoyancy to pull that to the surface. And when that gets pulled to the surface, the little ball that was sitting on here would ding the bell to say there's an incoming message coming. So the idea here was notice that you would connect the B and C electrodes and that would make bubbles under this cup. So B and C for a while and ding, and now I'm going to send the message after that. So that gives a way to alert the receiver. They could be in their uh, room uh, doing something or in their office doing something. They hear a ding, and they go, oh, there's a message coming in, and then they would go watch and write it down as the letters come in for the rest of the stuff. Very clever idea to say, well, how do I know when the message starts? Because I can't just have somebody sit there staring at this thing all day. So they made a way that it would make a, a bell ring to start the message. Very clever. And here you can see... Uh, the electrodes at the bottom of the fish tank. Over here you can see the thing that you would touch to the uh, the different letters to make the um, bubbles happen on the other end. And there's the battery. Interesting. And I suppose you could even have some fish in there if you wanted to. Have some uh, goldfish swimming around in here with the electrodes. Okay, so Von Sommering's invention uh, again, an improvement in a number of ways, but it still had a lot of wires. And distance was improved with it, because as long as current could flow through to the other end, it would work. Uh, but it still wasn't great, because we still had tons of wires that we needed to create. And so it was expensive to implement uh, for long distances. Uh, it still required watching 26 things at once, but they did have that improvement that it would ding a bell to tell you when to start looking at it with uh, one of the later inventions. So it's a little more practical, but still expensive due to the number of conductors uh, required. So the question is, if we still have too many wires, how can we reduce the number of wires? Is there a way to still send multiple symbols, but have fewer wires than we have symbols? And so I'm going to give you just a minute to, to think about that, and then we'll talk about it. So how could you send more symbols than you have wires? Okay, let's look at it. All right, the first attempt at doing that uh, that was successful, or at least successfully uh, implemented in any sort of uh, widespread fashion was uh, Wheatstone and Cook they created what's called the five-wire telegraph, and that happened in 1839. Now, they basically, rather than having a whole bundle of 26 wires, they boiled it down to just five, two, three, four, five wires. Significant improvement. And their idea was, let's use those five wires and combinations of voltages on those wires to represent some sort of... Um, uh, symbol. Now, each of those wires could have either no voltage on it, or they had like two batteries, one that was providing a positive voltage, one that was providing a negative voltage. Think about two batteries like this with the 
uh, center being no voltage, positive up here, negative down there. So in other words, you can push electrons through one way or pull electrons out the other way. And so basically they had this uh, system where you would out or where you would activate two of the wires at a time in either the positive direction or the negative direction. So in other words, this is a two of five kind of trinary uh, communication system or at least a positive and negative communication system. But if you're activating two of them at a time, think about the, the first one. You make a choice whether to do uh, with one of the five, whether to make it positive or negative. So there's two choices there. And then the next one, you have four choices that remain to make the next one positive or negative. So that gives... Uh, Here, hold on one second here. I have something left over. Okay, so that uh, gives 20 possible um, combinations. And it also uh, no longer required watching 26 things at once because the way that the, you'll see how this works in a second with the display, you don't have to watch 26 different things. You just have to watch five things because that's all that there are. So this here with 20 possible combinations meant that you could not have all the letters. So what they did is they skipped C, J, Q, V, X, and Y. So they took out six of the letters that are not used as often, basically just left them out. So now we only have five wires, but let's look at how it actually works. All right, so here's a picture of it. In other words, this is the encoding here. So C, J, Q, V, uh, X, and Y or X and Z, I think I might have said Y back here. That should be X and Z. Here, let me fix that real quick. Okay, so those were left out. And then looking at the machine, this is an actual machine from the era. This is how you look at it. So in other words, these the, across the middle here, and here you can see it better in these uh, views that are a little more stylized, are these needles. And those are kind of like the needle on, uh, like a, uh, think about it like the needle on a multimeter or some sort of sound level meter or something like that. So it can deflect one way or the other way, but its default position is in the middle. So in other words, up here, you'll notice that if this one, if the middle one deflects, to the, with the top to the right, and the one on the end, the uh, fifth one, deflects with the top to the left, that that indicates a crossing point of G up there. So in other words, if a needle moves, two needles move, you follow the thing and wherever they intersect, that's the letter you're encoding. So if you wanted to make the letter A, you take the first one, move it to the right, take the last one, move it to the left, and the intersecting point would be an A. So somebody to watch this, notice they don't have to watch 26 things at once, they just look at this and as soon as the needles move, you find, look at the letter that's in the intersecting point up here. So this is what the machine looked like here um, on its face. This is an actual one there uh, in action. And so all you had to do, it didn't require any real special skill to do that. And so to move the needles, if you, you would basically move these little switches down here. So if you'd push it, uh, Forward, it would be a positive voltage. Back would be a negative voltage. So forward means up here. Back means down here. So if, in other words, if I wanted to encode, I don't know, let's say an S, I say, okay, S is down here, and that's both of them on the bottom. So I would take this lever, the second one, and the fourth one, and I'd pull them both back, and that would encode the S. And you could see that, verify that encoding here. Now, this is the way the circuit worked. It's relatively uh, simple. These are the switches. And these are the little coils that would uh, move the needle either positive direction or negative direction. So in this case, notice uh, they are encoding an A. So this one's connected forward. This one's connected backwards. And on the other end, this needle follows the same way. Also notice there's another cool thing about this is you would have one of these on each end, which makes it kind of a two-directional uh, communication system as well. In other words, one, the person on this end could say, hello, and then the person on the other end could say, back, I'm here, or whatever.
by moving the, the levers around. And notice how simple the electronics of this are. Just a battery and some switches and some of these little needle things. And this was really kind of the first <coughs> use of kind of uh, encoding information in a way that had uh, these combinations of things, meaning uh, representing a larger number of symbols. Okay, so Wheatstone and Cook also later invented a uh, two and three needle version of this. Uh, or, uh, I mean, a two and one needle. Again, there's a typo. So I don't know why it's two and three. Okay, that's better. So the two and one needle versions, uh, though, were more difficult to use, that they required the sender and receiver to use like pulses, like groups of uh, signals to encode the output. But they were simpler and they had even fewer wires. So here's a chart that shows the five wire one we saw before, but here is how you would represent something with two needles. In other words, to make an A, you would leave the right one alone and the left one you would move to the, uh, the bottom of it to the right and then the bottom of it to the right again. So in other words, A is hold the lever still and take the one uh, that's in your left hand and go boop, boop, and for you that's backwards on the video here. But notice here is an actual one of those as well. There are the handles, the user would just grab a hold of those and go tick, tick, makes an A. Or if they wanted to make a B, tick, tick, tick. If they wanted to make an H, as we see down here, leave the left one alone, move the right one this way. So it's the same kind of concept, but notice it's more complicated to use. And the one needle one was even more complicated uh, with how to do that. And these ones that look like a check mark, that is moving it to that direction. In other words, to the right, and then the left briefly. So right for a little while, and then, so it's almost like, like that. So this uh, required a human operator to sit there and look at it, required a skilled operator to know that these were the codes. And again, this was uh, not as easy to use, but had fewer wires. Now these were used uh, actually quite a bit. Um, they were just harder to use and required a more skilled operator. Now, the, the one that really took off, though, was obviously if you're using wires, the ultimate reduction is to use just one wire. And the uh, big problem that we had back here with the one wire version of this, the one needle version of this, was it required somebody to look at that and it had this thing either forward or backwards. Um, sometimes it had groups of symbols that you had to combine. So it was not easy to use, and it also couldn't record the output in any way. It just required somebody staring at that and saying, well, I think that was an A. And notice that there are other problems here as well. Notice that C is, uh, again, this case is like backslash, 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 backslash. In other words, one, two, three, four. How do you know that that's not AA? And if the person did one, two, and they go, oh, crap, I'm doing C, I need to do two more, three, four that might look like an A. And also notice stop is that same thing. So how do we know that we're not getting B and stop when we get that so C? So it gets confusing for the operator. Now, an improvement that was made to that uh, to make it a little easier to understand is using Morse code. And that was in 1845. You can't see that because my face is in the way, but that says 1845 behind there. You'll be able to see that on the slides. Uh, and that reduces it down to one wire, or two if you're not using earth ground uh, to, as the return path. Now, that wire could have either no voltage or positive voltage. So this is already a little bit simpler because we don't have to worry about uh, the, uh, a battery that can produce both positive and negative voltage. We just have to have a battery that can produce some voltage. And it's simple to implement. It was just a key switch, which essentially worked like this little thing on the pen. You just push it down and it makes a contact and you let it up and it removes the contact. And a coil. So when you press that down, it makes contact. Electricity flows through the wire, wire through a coil on the other end. Coil on the other end makes a magnetic field, pulls a little metal plate down, 
makes it a little click. And one of the things that Samuel Morse's original invention had is it had, uh, it was designed to actually record the messages on a paper tape. So in other words, it had a reel of tape. The tape would go through and when the needle went down, it would make a little scratch, a, a hole in the paper uh, when you lift it up. So you get either short scratches or long scratches in there. And so the idea was it would just use combinations of what they called uh, dots and dashes. So in other words, a dot was a short uh, hold on the key, a dash was a longer hold on the key. Now eventually the paper tape was eliminated uh, because skilled operators could uh, just listen to the sound of the clicking. Click, 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 click. They could tell if it was long or short uh, by listening to it. And so a lot of the older or more recent telegraphs, you could have sound operators sitting there listening and writing down the message as it came in rather than it going onto a paper tape and then having somebody analyze and look it up. Now, it had a variable length coding system and it required skilled human operators to decode those. In other words, you had to know Morse code in order to be able to decode it. So let's look at how it worked uh, quickly. All right, so here are the letters A through Z. Here are the digits uh, zero through nine. And so in other words, A dot dash, B dash dot dot dot, C dash dot dash dot, E is just a dot. And he, he did put some thought into this and made the more common letters the shorter symbols. So E notices just one symbol. T is only one symbol. So those are the most two common letters. Um, and the less common letters are longer. So Y and Z uh, and Q are four symbols long. J is four symbols long. So he put some thought into this uh, and tried to make it. And then with the same kind of thing with the numbers uh, or digits down here. Here's a picture of that. Uh, this one, you can see him with his hand on the key below the table here. This is actually a, a battery. So this is like a, a voltaic uh, electrochemical battery under the table. That's how big that is. And when you press the key, the electricity flows through here, uh, which would then go to the other end. But essentially what you'd have is here's this paper tape. Here's the supply tape. Uh, there's where it's kind of reeling up the tape over there. But essentially what would happen is there you can see, I don't know if you can see that on your screen, but if you look really closely there, you can see the needle that actually pokes the holes in the tape. And up here you can kind of see the tape looks like it has like holes in it. I don't know if you can see that or not. But so essentially he would look at the thing he wanted to send. He knows Morse code. So he goes, okay, I'm sending high. I'm going to send dot, 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 dot. And then I is dot, dot. So dot, 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 dot. Wait a little bit, dot, dot. Hi, there, you would do the T, dash, H, again, dot, 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 E, dot, R, uh, dot, dash, dot, E, uh, dot. And so that would get recorded on the tape on the other end of the line, and then somebody could look at that. Or they could just listen to it, and if they were good, they could decode it. So very clever, but also very simple. You only need one wire running from here. Here you see that wire going up the wall. That's the one wire taking this message out uh, to the other end. Very simple. And also very clever. And also, incidentally, Morse uh, is also a, 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 was a, a well-respected artist and painter. And he's got some really remarkable uh, artworks, if you ever get a chance to look at it. He's well-known as a portrait artist, but he also did some stuff on his own. That He has a painting of the inside of the Louvre Museum in France. Uh, I believe that's which museum it was, but uh, he, his painting has all these great works of other artists built into it in the, on the walls in perspective. It's really uh, remarkably well done. All right, so reduced to one wire, it's still not perfect because it requires a skilled human operator. And it also, messages could be ambiguous. In other words, here is the sequ a sequence that could potentially be interpreted as high. Again, H was... Uh, if we looked at H over here, dot, 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 I is dot, dot. So if I have dot, 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 what is that? Is that high or is it I H or is it S S? Because S is also dot, dot, dot. So is it two S's or is it H E E or is it E E E E E E? And it required a skilled operator, but it also requires kind of the, the, to know this, pattern these patterns but it also requires kind of human knowledge to know okay well 
IH and uh, SS and HEE and EEEE might not make sense in the context of the rest of the message, but hi might. But maybe SS might. It's like somebody sending a telegram during World War II that they're being uh, invaded by uh, the SS. You might send a message, I'm being invaded by, and then this pattern, I'm being invaded by, hi, or I'm being invaded by SS. It's, uh, it's hard to tell with the message. So context matters in that, and it requires human uh, language understanding to really decode this because the message is, could be interpreted in different ways. So the question is, is there another way to do this where it could all be interpreted by a machine? In other words, you'd have an unskilled operator that pushes a letter on a keyboard, and that letter just goes to the other end, and pow, out comes that letter. Is there a way to do that? Let's take a quick look. Now, moving ahead a little bit to 1874, uh, Emile Baudot created what's called the Baudot five unit code system. And it used just a single wire, but it was a teletype system that allowed unskilled operators to send uh, these messages. So in other words, the messages would never be ambiguous. They don't require a human uh, mind with a lot of knowledge to decode it. And essentially the machine could encode and decode the messages and even record the messages on a paper tape uh, or even print them. And how did it work? Well, it used a fixed length code that was every message was five bits. And notice that was one of the problems with Morse code, that you have some that are one symbol long and some that are look, zero over here, five symbols long. And you would have maybe some that are uh, two symbols and three symbols and four symbols. It's, it's kind of a variable length code. But Baudot's system is a fixed length code. Every message was five bits long. And this was the first use of kind of a binary fixed length code, uh, which is similar to what we still use today uh, for ASCII code and other things inside of computers. All right, so here's how Baudot's system worked. Uh, here is the encoding. And notice that with five different uh, symbols, we have two to the fifth uh, possibilities, which gives us uh, the ability to have uh, 32 different symbols. And essentially, the way that he, uh, he did this with those five bits is every sequence of five bits had a meaning. Now, some of them, like, let's, let's find the letter A here. There's the letter A. So 00011 is an A. But he did something that was really clever. He made it so that 00011 actually has two possible meanings. It could mean A, like we see here, or it could mean dash, like we see over here. And the way he did that is he divided it up into what are called letters and what are called figures. And then he made a special code to switch between them. So letters, if you send one, 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 all five of bits are one. Well, all five bits are one. Let me do it this way. All five bits are one. That means switch to the letter set. And if you send one, one, zero, one, one, that meant switch to the figure set. And he also had blank and space reserved in both sets and line feed reserved in both sets. But then there were some special functions here for other things too, like uh, bell would make a bell ding, carriage return. And then there were a couple reserved ones which people could remap to other things uh, for their machines. Now this also had a paper tape, uh, and the, I want to explain how this works because this is actually really interesting. That this used a system that was is now called time division multiplexing. In other words, we have one line. There's the one line, and the this is from the pattern, one of the patterns. There's the one line, and what happens is this arm. Think of this kind of like a clock that's rotating in reverse, or a motor that's spinning, and this one is also spinning. So what happens is. You'd set the switches you want for the pattern you want. So, for example, if I wanted to send the letter A, which we already looked at here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, we would leave this one open, 0, 0, 0, but then we would close that one and that one. So, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. And what's going to happen is as this thing spins around, it's going to make a contact between, this is a metal thing here that's kind of brushing against the surface of that. It's rolling around this ring, and when it hits here, it's going to make a contact between that, which is connected to the wire, 
and that, which is the first switch. So in other words, if the first switch is open, no voltage goes on there, no voltage goes on there, no voltage goes on there, but this switch, switch uh, four is closed and five is closed. So now we get voltage that goes on the line and then a little break between them and voltage that goes on the line there. And what's gonna happen is on the other end, as this one, if, if this and this are synchronized, then this one's gonna see no voltage when it's here, no voltage when it's there, no voltage when it's there, but voltage when it's there, which is going to activate this thing here, which is kind of like those little uh, needles we saw earlier, but these ones latch, they stick in the position they go in. So in other words, click, click. So now we have zero, 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 one, one latched in on this end. And when those click, they could, once all of these are done, that gets to the end, it could punch a paper tape when this gets all the way up to this position. And when that paper tape gets punched, now we have that zero, 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 one, one pattern stored on the tape. And th this is essentially like how a distributor in your car works. How does it know, route the signal? Well, if you have an older car, modern cars use electronic ignition, but an older car, there's a distributor that has a rotor that spins and it directs the spark to the cylinders in the right order. So if you have an eight cylinder car, it would go uh, tick, 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 tick through all eight cylinders or a six cylinder car, or four cylinder car, same concept. So this is routing switch one onto the line first, and then that comes off the line, and then switch two goes onto the line, and then switch three, and then switch four, and switch five. And since these two things are synchronized, then we get one, two, three, four, five, either latched or not latched. And we have the pattern over here now copied from the one that was over there. Absolutely brilliant uh, machine. And it's called time division multiplexing because we're giving each bit a section of time on the line of the five bits. Here's one of the paper tapes from the machine where you can see the holes being punched or not punched. And notice here are some with all of them punched. That would be all ones. So that's saying letters multiple times in a row. And here's one of the machines. There you can see the keyboard that you use for typing on. Uh, and this is Creed's uh, version of the machine, but it's still used five unit code, uh, just like Bado invented. And there you can see the motor that spins, that rotates the stuff, and here's the distributor. Uh, so you'd push the key, pushing that key puts the right pattern on the switches, it goes across to the other end, and then it would print that thing out and back a page. Here you can see the paper tape, but they made things that actually printed these thing messages out. So you could actually just type a message on one end, and you could read that message like a printed piece of text. Uh, that would come out on the other end. Absolutely brilliant uh, machines. And keep in mind that all of this was sending those messages. You press an A, 100 miles away, an A pops out. You press a B, 100 miles away, a B pops out. And all of that was done without any kind of electronics. It was all done mechanically like this. But you could type on it like a typewriter, and it would remotely type on the other end. Absolutely brilliant. Now, interestingly, uh, that same kind of system with, is like a binary code that we use today. Just like these ones and zeros here, that's not really that much different than what's being stored on your hard, hard drive when you're, uh, or on a uh, uh, Blu-ray disc when you put it in your Blu-ray player. Okay, so anyway, here's an example of, oops, of an encoding. Here we're saying hello. So first we send letters to make sure it's in the letters uh, configuration. And then we send H, which here's H in the table, 1100, H, E, 00001, L, 10010, another L, 10010, and O, 11000. That's what hello would look like. Notice there's no ambiguity here. They're always in groups of five. One revolution sends one message. And there are some concerns here that we'll talk about next class, but how do we make sure that these, to, for this to work, this has to be synchronized with that. How do we make sure those are lined up? Another question that might come up is, uh, what happens if they get out of sync where one is off from the other one, then the bits are all wrong and we're looking in the wrong place uh, for when this is coming across. We'll talk about that later on. But it's important to note that machines like these, they had a way to deal with that. Very clever.
Okay, so modern times, uh, fast forwarding to modern times, notice that the modern communication systems uh, and even your computer itself is using these uh, kind of concepts that came up all the way back to uh, the electrostatic telegraph that Lesage made. So, uh, and those Victorian era, era inventions like the telegraph, the teletype, the telephone, we're still using variants or in some cases even the same systems today. And so as an example of that, those things that we owe our history to is Morse. Samuel Morse would recognize the logic and simplicity of a single wire communication system we use today. He was like, well, we need a single wire communication system like a telegraph. Uh, well, guess what? you have when you're communicating uh, information uh, from one place to another place inside of your computer. Well, there are wires in there that have either their voltage or not voltage, just like the telegraph, um, communicating that. And a serial communication system that we use today would look a lot like that. If you were to look at the voltage on the line, it would do it much more quickly than the Morse code did. And in, including Morse code having short uh, dots and long dashes, short and long pulses. Well, when you use your, your remote control for your TV, it's using that a similar kind of thing. It's using a pulse width based communication system similar to Morse code that it's dots and dashes. It's long and short, long and short represent the bits. He would recognize that. Uh, Emile Baudot would recognize our ASCII code because our ASCII code looks a whole lot like this table. It's just a different thing and it has seven bits or eight bits if it's extended ASCII rather than just five. But he would recognize that. The ASCII code and our serial communication methods that use that fixed length coding system instead of five bits, serial communication uses seven or eight, uh, sometimes nine, but usually seven or eight, usually eight. But he would recognize that. And Bell, Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone line interface, it's actually, then this is where it is really fascinating. Even though uh, the phone network has changed, our modern phone network has changed, the CO uh, or connection interface or subscriber loop that comes into your house if you have a wired phone line, that is the same as it was in Bell's day. That hasn't changed. In other words, you could take a phone uh, from over 100 years ago and plug it into your phone today and it would work. Amazing. All right, so let's uh, finish up here. Uh, we've talked for a little while. And finishing up here, the I want to talk about abstracting this stuff we've talked about. In other words, what do all of those have in common? And what do all communication systems have in common? And it's important to be able to abstract that because it's going to allow us to do some thinking about uh, those things going forward. So here, uh, first off, this is the components of a communication system. The goal is to get information from here over to here. But to do that, we need some way of taking this information, dividing it up into chunks, putting it into this transmitter that then puts it onto the channel. And the channel um, is really a thing conveying the data and the receiver then receives it. And then on the destination, we now have the message pop out the other end. So quickly, uh, before we go back, notice this this noise thing here, that things can happen to this channel that cause it the message to be imperfect maybe as it gets put on there. So going back just for a second here, uh, looking at this, notice we have the message that's coming in that's wanting to be transmitted. This whole thing is the transmitter. This wire, the single wire is the channel. Here's the receiver. And then here's the information coming out as it was put in over here. So very uh, much follows that model that we have over here. In fact, all communication systems. The transmitter for Morse code, that little key switch. The receiver for Morse code, the coil, and the little clacker, and maybe the paper tape uh, that's receiving it. The channel, that single wire that's carrying uh, the data. So the source produces the information. Could be analog, could be digital. The transmitter is what puts the source data onto the channel. The channel is the thing that carries the signal. It could be a wire or more than one wire. Uh, it could be sound. It could be light, like the IR remote on your, for your TV. Uh, it could be sound, like me talking now, trying to get ideas out of my head 
into your head. The transmitter being my voice. Uh, also, it could be light. Me gesturing and talking and you watching this video. Could be radio waves if you're using uh, something that sends radio waves. Could be anything. Could be smoke signals. All right. So it's anything that could carry the signal uh, from one end to the other. Now, it could carry the signal directly or it might require modulation of some sort. So for example, modulation is just encoding the message in some other uh, form. Uh, for example, me talking, that's a form of modulation. I'm taking my idea, I'm encoding that idea. Sound waves, which are actually just uh, um, air molecules being compressed and carrying that wave through the, the air. And then your ears are the decoder for that, that are demodulating that, pulling it off of the sound waves and hopefully getting that idea out of my head into your head. The receiver is the thing that then does that decoding and then the destination is the, the consumer of that information, the thing that uses the information. Okay, so that's all for today. There is one assignment uh, that I've called Lab Zero or Assignment Zero that's been posted to the course page. Uh, and really, it's, it's very simple. It doesn't have you do anything uh, related to the material. It's just a way for me to get to know you a little better uh, and a way for you to make sure you know how to use the Blackboard system. It's also kind of my way of taking attendance on the first day of class. Uh, but you're just basically going to make a word process document that is d as described in the lab sheet. Put a picture of yourself in there so I have something to associate with your name if I don't already know you. And so that's all we're going to do today. So, so I want you to stay safe. Now, one quick comment here at the end of the video, if you made it to the end of the video. It's important that you watch these lectures. Last semester, I had a number of people that didn't watch the lectures. They would maybe watch part of it and they uh, stop halfway through. Or they, if they did watch the lecture, they'd turn it on and then chat with people on Reddit while it was playing. Or they would chat with people on Discord while it was uh, playing. Or they would uh, turn it on and play video games while it was going. You need to watch these like you were sitting in a classroom. In other words, try to do these things. Watch these lectures in a, uh, a disciplined way. Don't be distracted, don't goof around with other things, don't get on Discord, don't play video games with your friends, don't uh, be disciplined about it because the data uh, that I'm going to convey to you in here is going to be important for your success in this class and the knowledge that you can gain from this class is going to be important for your success in your career and in the degree. So try to be disciplined. What I would suggest doing is if you have uh, the ability to do so, Watch the lectures on a smart TV uh, or something like that. Subscribe to my channel and when I post new lectures, uh, these are all going to be on YouTube, so you can subscribe to my YouTube channel when I post a new lecture for this class. Sit down at your smart TV, turn it on. Uh, I don't know, sit down with a, uh, a glass of Coke or a, a, a bowl of chips and watch it and just watch it. Don't uh, goof around and do other things while it's going on. It's going to show up in your grade and your performance, and ultimately you're not going to learn the stuff you need to learn to be successful. Assuming you want to be a wizard and do magical things. All right, anyway, that's it. Stay safe. Uh, make sure to do that lab zero and get that submitted. That's due by Wednesday at the beginning of class, so don't dawdle and put it off. Do it right now. Uh, get it done. All right, that's it, and I'll see you guys next time. Uh, if you have questions or problems, always I'm here to help and answer. So send me an email, send me a text. Uh, and that's all. Bye.